afternoon of fly fishing is stopped cold by a freak accident. It just slapped me into the water. His foot pinned by a two-ton boulder. I tried, but there was no way out. The angler is hopelessly stuck. In water so cold, he could freeze to death in a few hours. I was truly scared. I just kept yelling. His only hope is his will to live, faith in a higher authority, and his fight to survive. In the wild, when things go bad, they go bad fast. Without warning, your life can hang by a thread. Adventurer and survivor Craig DiMartino fought back from his own wilderness disaster to reclaim his life. Now Craig meets other courageous outdoorsmen who beat the odds and return from their own fight to survive. Hi, I'm Craig DiMartino. I love being outside. The rock climbing is my passion. Even though that passion resulted in the loss of one of my legs a few years ago, there's still no sport I find as challenging and fun that I'd rather be doing. Fly fishing is Dean Ryrie's passion. But casting out a line one summer afternoon nearly cost him his life. This is no fish tale, but a chilling story of one man's faith and perhaps even a miracle. Since Dean Ryrie was a kid, he's loved the outdoors. From the rush of skiing to the tranquility of fly fishing. My father taught me how to use a fly rod when I was a teenager, and I just developed a real passion for it. If the trout are running, Dean's got a line out there. Fishing's my second religion. Growing up, there's two things you can do on Sunday. One of them was go to church, and the other one was fly fish. Does that promise to give him more hours? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Dean lives with his wife and kids just outside Salt Lake City, Utah. Not far away is Little Cottonwood Canyon, home to some of the best outdoor recreation in the country. July 28, 2008 was a typical summer day. As he had done many times before, Dean made the spur of the moment decision to spend the afternoon fishing. I have a good spot near Tanner Flats on Little Cottonwood Creek. And uh, the fishing really seems to get good in the evening and I'd get there just in time to catch what I wanted to and, and home before dark. Which is good. And have a little fish fry with my daughter. <laughs> Dean drove 30 minutes up the canyon and parked near Tanner's Flat Campground. Dean knew there was no reception in the canyon, so he left his cell phone in the truck. He would usually call and let me know I'm gonna head out fishing and would usually tell me where he's going. It just happened to be on this particular day he had not. Dean hiked through rugged brush to reach the area he wanted to fish. He had hooked some nice size rainbow trout there before. There was fresh snow runoff coming from both sides of the canyon, so there was a lot of rushing water coming through. The creek temperature's quite, quite low. <laughs> when he arrived at the creek, he noted the current. Even in summer, the river's water temperature can be an icy 45 degrees. The creek is also a watershed, so waders are mandatory. He put his on, but didn't head into the middle of the river. Instead, Dean set up his gear on a large rock near shore. I saw a promising spot across the creek and cast it into it and immediately had a hit. But because he was standing high on the rock and not in the water, Dean worried he'd lose the fish when he reeled it in so he decided to move in closer. I moved off of that big rock onto a smaller one that was just barely submerged. It twisted to the side and slapped me right into the water hard. A split second later, Dean was completely submerged. I was crawling on the creek bed, thinking that this rock's gonna roll over, I'm gonna drown. And I was thinking, this is the end. Your life flashes before you, all the things they say. I didn't want to go out like that. Dean clawed at the bottom of the creek. I wasn't sure I was going to make it, but I twisted just right and popped up. Happy to be alive. His happiness quickly faded. The rock that shifted was actually a two-ton boulder, and it had an ironclad grasp on Dean's right foot. I was completely stuck. 
that's when I realized how big the rock was. It wasn't moving. Chest deep in the bitterly cold water, Dean's next realization was all the more alarming. I started feeling the cold immediately. My waders were completely ripped. He was now at risk of becoming hypothermic in the freezing water, and his body temperature began to drop rapidly. It's fresh runoff from ski resorts. That water's cold. As the severity of his situation sunk in, Dean saw he wasn't the only one trapped. Hey, there's still a fish there. I looked at the fish and I said, at least one of us is gonna live through this. I'm not sure it's gonna be me, so I'm gonna let you go. And I said goodbye to him. I was scared, I was truly scared at that point. It was still not dark, so I started yelling for help in the hope that somebody would come close enough on the trail to hear me. There was a campground nearby, so maybe, just maybe. I just kept yelling. But his cries, no match for the rushing water, were immediately drowned out. And nobody came. It was an innocent hop from one rock to the next, but Dean Ryrie slipped. Now his right foot was trapped by a two-ton boulder, holding him down in icy creek water. All he could do was scream for help, hoping someone would find him before he froze to death. When I got to thinking about how dire my situation was, I just told my Heavenly Father that, hey, don't let me go out this way. Dean desperately attempted to stave off the cold. I took my vest off, laid it on the rock, hoping it would dry enough to keep me warm enough to survive until somebody found me. When it started getting dark, I, I knew it was time to hunker in for the night, but I, I continued to yell. Continued to pray that the Lord would preserve me to see my family again, tell my wife that I love her, and hold my kids in my arms. Back at his home, his wife was beginning to wonder where he was. I started to worry, but then I thought, no, he'll be okay. He, you know, he knows what he's doing. And a lot of times he'll fish until late because that tends to be when the fish are a little bit more active. And it wasn't until after midnight that I really started to get worried. I had tried calling Dean on his cell phone several times, and I was not getting any answer at all. While Tracy tried to reach her husband, Dean continued to cry out for help. Oh! I kept yelling. Oh! I kept yelling. I kept yelling. Oh, Still nothing happened. You can't believe the power this water has. Craig DiMartino lived through his own terrifying trauma. He wanted to hear how Dean dealt with the feeling of helplessness, cold, and the hours alone. It gets dark, right? You're, you, you've, you've settled in. Now what? What do you feel about? In that water, a lot of people say, boy, that must have been the longest night of your life. It had to be. And you know what? It, it wasn't. It was the shortest night of my life. It really was. I started fearing, and that's when I, I turned to my faith and started to pray. I, I felt the presence of my ancestors who had passed on uh, there beside me, strengthening me. And I wasn't alone. Oh, yeah. There's nothing like that feeling, and I felt that. Uh, I felt my mother's arms around me. I felt the presence of my grandfather. I thought a, a lot about past experiences with him, and I know they placed those, those memories in my mind at that time to comfort me. That feeling was with me so strong. All I knew was that the Lord answered my prayer. He sent angels to lift me up. And those angels were my family. I, I just knew I was going to make it. I didn't realize how bad the situation was still. And I'm glad I didn't because it got me through the night. Dean's spirits were lifted by memories of his family. 
But back at his house, Dean's wife was now extremely anxious. Tracy could no longer simply stare at the clock and hope that Dean would walk through the door. She and her son decided to go look for him. Okay, you look on that side and I'll look on this side. Okay. Which meant driving to all of Dean's favorite fishing spots. He'd been fishing at several different canyons, so when it came time to look for him, it was a bit of a challenge. How the spots up here? We headed all the way up one of the canyons and all the way back down and did not find his vehicle. Where else could he have gone? Waiting, wondering where he was at, it just seemed like a night that took forever. It had been nearly eight hours since Dean's ordeal began. His body temperature had dropped to a point where others would be dead already. How much longer could he possibly hold on? Fisherman Dean Ryrie was just trying to jump from one rock to another when he ended up trapped by a boulder in an icy creek. 14 hours later, he was barely clinging to life. It had just finished a little rain that had fallen and I started feeling really cold again. And I didn't really feel the presence of my family nearly as much. Gathering what strength he had left, ah! Dean called out for help again. As the sun came up, Tracy continued her search, this time driving up to Tanner's flat campground. That's where I found our truck sitting there. And then I knew something was wrong. Right about that time, a father and his young son, who were camping at Tanner Flats, decided to hike down by the river. As I continued to yell, help, somebody please help me, this little angel appeared on the side of the creek. Are you okay? And that's all I can describe him as, and I was so happy to see him. No, okay, I'll be right back. So he ran off. I thought, oh boy, hope he gets back quick. <laughs> And he came back with his dad, and I had my arms tucked in like I had been. His dad looked at me and says, oh, you got a broken arm? I said, no, but my foot's stuck between these two boulders, and I've been here all night. And this guy's just face just went white. The father immediately took off to find a phone and called 911. 911, what is the address of the emergency? Uh, yeah, Tanner's flat, and the male has his foot stuck between two rocks. Not sure what they were going to find, rescue workers raced to the scene. Police and ambulances came flying out the um, road into the campground. I didn't know what was going on. Tracy feared the worst. Soon she found out that the commotion was a desperate attempt to rescue Dean. One of the first responders was Jake Harmer, a 10-year veteran paramedic with the Unified Fire Authority of Greater Salt Lake. The only details we had is that we had someone stuck in the river, and we knew that it could be quite a perilous situation. During the time of year that it was, the river is extremely high. The only way to get in to see him was to be in the water with him. As I went into the water, my first thought was, wow, this water is really cold. The first person that I saw face to face was Jake Harmer. Okay, let's see if I can help you out. Okay, Jake has a, a real sp special spirit about him. He's stuck in there pretty good. Is that your foot? Yeah. yeah. And we're going to need a lot of help to set up all the technical aspects of a swift water rescue. Yeah. hot blankets and compresses and vests on me, and my spirit soared. I thought, well, it's only a matter of time. Okay, I need a full set of vitals with the temperature, okay? Okay, I'm going to take the temperature. Stand up, all right? When we took Dean's body temperature, we took it tympanically in his ear. It read 63. It's really cold. We need a warm fluid. I thought for sure that our equipment was incorrect. 
Everybody's told me. Nobody's ever conscious of that. That's the temperature of a corpse, man. He brings an IV, and I said, you put an IV? Can't we just get me out first? Well, we might not get you out for a while. It doesn't look easy. I realized that if we didn't get him out quickly, I could lose him altogether. More rescue workers arrived. By now, Dean was exhibiting symptoms of extreme hypothermia. Initially, we tried to move the rock ourselves. That wasn't happening at all. Dean watched helplessly as additional efforts to move the massive boulder failed. I did kind of start thinking that they're running out of options. We were in worse shape than I had initially thought. At that point, I didn't know how much longer he could be conscious. First responders and survivors often share a special connection. Dean and Craig both know what it's like when someone holds your life in their hands. When they got in the creek with you, was it relief? Jake was awesome. He was very composed, but there's so many uh, Sheriff's Department and Fire Department. They wouldn't even let my wife get close to me because there's too much that the other guys were doing. That's and terrifying. You got a lot of people for one guy. That That's heavy. They're in the river now. Where yeah, you just been? I'm watching them spell each other off every 10, 15 minutes because they were getting too cold. Right. But Dean was the one in real danger. Jake knew that Dean's only hope was the department's heavy rescue equipment. At the time, they hadn't arrived yet. And I was starting to get worried that it was taking far too long. Finally, the heavy rescue specialists arrived. Jake told me that they were going to use the Kevlar airbags. I'd never heard of them before. These are the type of airbags that we use in heavy rescue situations, such as structural collapse, moving large cement slabs. We thought that if we could get one underneath the rock, then we could lift it just enough to free his foot. Dean had been standing in the river for almost 17 hours. This was a last-ditch effort. If this didn't work, I had nothing I could do to help him and I would watch him die. It had been over an hour since first responders reached Dean Ryrie. But the fisherman's foot was still trapped, and his body temperature was down to an unbelievable and deadly 63 degrees. Rescue workers devised a plan to free Dean using Kevlar airbags, normally used after structural collapses. We thought, this is our last chance. I could see some urgency in some of the faces. Some of the other guys were scurrying around, pretty nervous. If this didn't work, we were at, at the end. I really didn't want to see Dean perish right there with me. So we started inflating, and as we pulled on him, pop, I'm out. I didn't feel any water rushing past me anymore. What a feeling, but it didn't last long because my foot started hurting really bad. As blood rushed back into Dean's foot, he experienced blinding pain. Just because he was out of the river did not mean he was out of the woods. Whenever you have a crush injury like this, you have so much damage it could send his heart into arrhythmias and we could still lose him. We had an army of people there ready to take him out to his ride to the hospital. A waiting helicopter rushed Dean to Intermountain Medical Center. At that point, I realized how exactly cold I was. I had only been in the water for perhaps 45 minutes, and it was almost unthinkable for me to imagine surviving being in that water for 16 hours. Dean woke up in the ICU. After being treated for advanced hypothermia, he was finally reunited with his family. When we were able to finally see Dean in the hospital, he was just upset with himself. I'm sorry this happened. I, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. They had been looking for me all night. I didn't know that until that point. 
because I didn't tell anybody where I was going, which is stupid. <laughs> Though they were able to save Dean's life, doctors were not sure they could save his injured foot. Because his foot was so swollen, they take the scalpel and they make little marks all over it. Just allow it to be able to swell, and it, it wasn't... It wasn't a good sight. <laughs> Everybody kept giving me prosthetics are so good these days. <laughs> Trying to really pump me up. And then of course my reaction was, get me into a ski boot. I can't live without skiing, I just can't. Again, Dean amazed everyone. Though he lost seven of the nine extender tendons in his right foot, doctors were able to save it. The water temperature, which just about killed me, it's probably the reason I have a foot. It preserved the tissue to the point where what did survive, survived well. After his harrowing ordeal, Dean spent 10 days in the hospital. The guys at the sheriff's department told me that the time that they've done any rescues, never had anybody survive it, it gone to that depth. It takes a special type of person to overcome and endure such amazing and unreal circumstances. And I think Dean is one of those special people that just had it in his will that he would not die. Once he returned home, Dean went through extensive rehabilitation. Today, he's still able to fish and ski as often as he likes, which is good because Dean's passion for the outdoors has not changed and neither has his passion for life. I can't go through a day without looking up and saying thanks for life. Air is a gift. <laughs>